Chapter 44 from Timby and Chapter 17 from Concepts, Introduction to the Gastrointestinal System and Accessory Structures. Learning Objectives. Define and describe the concept of elimination. Identify major organs and structures of the GI system. Discuss important information to ascertain about gastrointestinal health. Notice risk factors that place individuals at risk for elimination problems. Recognize when an individual has problems with elimination. Identify facts in the client's history that provide pertinent data about the present illness. Discuss physical assessments that are pertinent to gastrointestinal tract function. Describe common diagnostic tests performed on clients with GI disorders. Describe nursing measures after liver biopsy. Explain nursing management of clients undergoing diagnostic testing for a GI disorder. The scope of this concept includes the normal or expected physiological process of waste formation and excretion by the GI and renal systems, as well as problems associated with this process. The process of waste formation in the renal and GI systems is very different. The kidneys are responsible for the removal of metabolic waste and other elements from the blood in the form of urine, and the GI tract is responsible for the removal of digestive waste in the form of stool. The excretion of urine and stool normally occurs under voluntary control. The scope of this concept also includes an impairment of elimination. A wide range of problems and conditions contribute to impaired elimination. These are explored in greater detail in the sections that follow. Normal physiologic process. Normal urinary Elimination. Urinary elimination involves the process of waste formation, production of urine, and the excretion of urine involving several specific structures. The kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra must all function adequately for normal urination to occur. The formation of urine. The formation of urine is complex and involves three main processes. Glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. The main functional unit of the kidneys is the nephron. Each kidney has more than one million nephrons. Each nephron is composed of two parts, blood vessels and renal tubules. Optimal physiological effect of the kidneys depends on continuous perfusion of a large volume of blood, an average of one liter per minute to the kidneys and functioning nephrons. Blood enters the kidney through the renal artery. Upon entering the kidney, the renal artery branches into progressively smaller arteries, arterioles, and finally to a cluster of capillaries known as the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a semi-permeable membrane that serves to filter blood into a C-shaped structure of the renal tubule known as the Bowman's capsule. This process, glomerular filtration, represents the beginning of urine formation. This filtrate contains water, electrolytes, and waste that have been removed from the blood. As the filtrate passes through a sequence of renal tubules from the Bowman's capsule to the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule, a network of capillaries surrounding the renal tubules reabsorb most of the water, electrolytes, and other necessary elements back into the blood. This process is referred to as tubular reabsorption. The third process, tubular secretion, involves a secondary process for small amounts of select substances such as potassium, hydrogen, ammonia, and drugs to be moved from the blood in the capillaries surrounding the tubules into the tubules. The amount of water and electrolytes absorbed into the blood or excreted in the renal tubules is controlled by several hormones, particularly aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, parathyroid hormone, renin, and atrial natriuretic factor. Atrial natriuretic factor 
works with the kidneys to excrete sodium and water and inhibit um, aldosterone. Excretion of urine. Urine formed in the renal tubules moves into the collecting duct and then into the renal pelvis, the ureter, and the bladder where it is stored until urination occurs. The bladder holds approximately 300 to 500 milliliters before the pressure increases enough for stretch receptors in the bladder to signal the need for urination. An internal sphincter composed of smooth muscle contracts involuntarily to prevent urine from leaking out of the bladder. The external sphincter located just below the internal sphincter and surrounding the upper part of the urethra is composed of skeletal muscle and is voluntarily controlled. Thus, the process of urination involves a series of nerve signals between the bladder and spinal cord to trigger the micturition reflex. This causes the internal sphincter muscles to relax and the bladder wall contraction. With the voluntary relaxation of the external urinary sphincter, urine passes out of the body through the urethra. The external urinary sphincter must be under the individual's control in order for urinary control or continence to be successful. Anatomy and physiology. The mouth. Food normally enters the GI system at the mouth where it is chewed or masticated before being swallowed. Food that contains starch undergoes partial digestion when it mixes with the enzyme ptalin salivary amylase, which the salivary glands secrete. Table 44.2 in Timby outlines how oral structures participate in digestion on page 758. Esophagus. The esophagus begins at the base of the pharynx behind the trachea and ends at the opening to the stomach. It is approximately 25 centimeters or 10 inches long. Layers of muscle tissue surround the esophagus. They consist of striated, banded, or striped muscle tissue in the proximal esophagus, striated and smooth muscle in the mid esophagus, and smooth muscle in the lower esophagus. Coordinated movements of these muscle layers propel food from the pharynx into the stomach. These wave-like contractions are known as peristalsis. An upper esophageal sphincter or pharyngeal esophageal sphincter located at the upper end of the esophagus prevents air from entering the esophagus and stomach during respiration. The lower esophageal sphincter or gastroesophageal sphincter is located where the esophagus joins the stomach. It remains contracted in order to prevent reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus. The esophagus passes through an opening in the diaphragm called a hiatus, H-I-A-T-U-S, as it connects to the stomach. The stomach. The stomach, which is located in the left side of the abdomen, temporarily holds ingested food and prepares it by mechanical and chemical action to pass in semi-liquid form into the small intestine. The opening between the esophagus and stomach is called the lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter, so named because of the proximity of the heart. The opening between the stomach and duodenum is called the pyloric sphincter. The opening between the stomach and duodenum is called the pyloric sphincter. The opening between the esophagus and stomach is called the lower esophageal sphincter or cardiac sphincter because it's close to the heart. And again, the opening between the stomach and duodenum, small intestine, is called the pyloric sphincter. Both sphincters are circular bands of muscle fibers. When contracted, these sphincters keep stomach contents enclosed or confined. When the pyloric sphincter relaxes, stomach contents flow to the duodenum. Gastric secretions that contain digestive enzymes are released continuously, but increase when food is eaten. Gastric secretions are acidic because they contain hydrochloric acid. The contractions of the stomach mix the food with the gastric secretions and move the mixture of semi-liquid food called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, to the small intestine by peristalsis. The time required for the stomach to empty depends on the amount and composition of food. 
Fats, for example, delay stomach emptying. Is the following statement true or false? The esophagus temporarily holds the food. This is false. The stomach temporarily holds the food. The esophagus is involved in peristalsis and in moving the food to the stomach. Small intestine. The small intestine or the middle portion of the GI tract is divided into three portions the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. The duodenum, which is approximately 10 inches long, is the first region of the small intestine and contains the opening for the common bile duct and the primary pancreatic duct, which allow, common, which allow bile and pancreatic enzymes to enter. Bile, a fluid synthesized by the liver, breaks down fats into lipids. Pancreatic enzymes aid in the digestion of lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. These secretions continue to promote the chemical breakdown of food and transform chyme to an alkaline state. Peristalsis mechanically propels the mixture, which is semi-liquid semi at this point, into the jejunum and ileum, which have a combined length of approximately 23 feet. The primary function of the small intestine is to absorb nutrients from the chyme. Absorption of different nutrients occurs at different sites in the small intestine. When a part of the small intestine is diseased or removed surgically, the absorption in that area is diminished or lost altogether. The ileocecal valve lies at the distal end of the small intestine and the upper portion of the cecum and regulates the flow of intestinal contents, which are liquid at this point, into the large intestine. It also prevents the reflux of feces and bacteria from the large intestine, preserving the relative sterility of the small intestine. The large intestine is approximately four to five feet long and two inches in diameter, receives waste from the small intestine and propels waste toward the anus, the opening from the body for elimination. The large intestine absorbs water, some electrolytes, vitamin K, and bile acids. The cecum, colon, rectum, and anal canal make up the structures of the large intestine through which fecal material passes. The cecum is a pouch-like structure at the beginning of the large intestine. The appendix, a narrow blind tube at the tip of the cecum, has no known function in humans. The colon is divided into the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colons. The ascending colon starts at the cecum, traversing the underside of the liver, and turning at what is referred to as the right hepatic flexure. At this point, the transverse colon crosses the upper half of the abdomen from right to left, and then it turns downward under the lower end of the spleen to form the splenic flexure. The descending colon goes from this point to the rectum, which connects the sigmoid colon to the anus. In the colon, the unabsorbed material becomes fecal matter, which is composed of water, food residue, microorganisms, digestive secretions, and mucus. Water is reabsorbed by means of diffusion across the intestinal membrane as the mixture moves through the colon. By the time the mixture reaches the descending and sigmoid colon, it is a formed mass. The rectum holds and retains fecal material through the contraction of the internal and external anal sphincters. As fecal mass accumulates, it distends the rectal wall, creating the urge to defecate. When the external anal sphincter relaxes, the fecal matter is expelled through the anus. Assessment of older adults must include patterns of defecation, changes in dietary intake or hydration, reduced abdominal or sphincter muscle tone, decreased awareness of the filling reflex or diminished control of the rectal sphincter due to changes in innervation can contribute to either constipation or incontinence. Dietary intake of fibrous fruits and vegetables, adequate fluid throughout the day, mobility or passive range of motion exercises, and scheduled times for defecation approximately 30 minutes after a meal can assist older adults with routine bowel evacuation. If any portion of the large intestine becomes diseased or is surgically removed, 
its absorptive function is diminished or lost. This may result in the passage of loose stools and potential fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Passage of liquid stool, which contains many bile salts, makes the client especially vulnerable to skin breakdown in the perianal area. If stool remains in the large intestine too long, constipation results. The client may then strain to evacuate hard, solid stool, which can, disru can disrupt skin integrity. Table 44-4 describes the implications of age-related changes in the GI system. Accessory structures. The three accessory digestive organs are the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. The liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. Although not an accessory structure itself, the peritoneum encloses the abdominal organs. The peritoneum. The peritoneum, a membrane that lines the inner abdomen, encloses the viscera and the serous fluid that it secretes. It allows the abdominal organs to move about without creating friction. The walls of the digestive organs normally prevent the gastric and intestinal contents from escaping into the peritoneal cavity. Any perforation that allows material to seep out of the digestive tract is serious because the microorganisms and enzymes can cause a severe inflammation and infection of the surrounding tissue. This condition is known as peritonitis. Liver. The liver is the largest glandular organ in the body weighing between 1 and 1.5 kilograms or 2 to 3 pounds. It is located in the right upper abdomen just under the diaphragm which separates the liver from the right lung. The liver is involved in many vital complex metabolic activities. It forms and releases bile, processes vitamins, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, stores glycogen, contributes to blood coagulation, metabolizes and biotransforms many chemicals, including drugs, bacteria, and foreign matter, and forms antibodies and immunizing substances called gamma globulin. See chapter 47 for more information. The gallbladder. The gallbladder is attached to the mid portion of the undersurface of the liver. It normally has a thin wall and holds approximately 60 milliliters of bile. The liver forms approximately one liter of bile each day. When the bile reaches the gallbladder from the common hepatic duct, water and minerals are absorbed from the bile to form a more concentrated product. Gallbladder contraction triggered by ingested food, especially fats, causes bile to be released first through the cystic duct and then the common bile duct into the duodenum where it aids in the absorption of fats, fat vi fat soluble vitamins, iron and calcium. Bile also activates the pancreas to release its digestive enzymes and an alkaline fluid that neutralizes stomach acids that reach the duodenum. Pancreas. The pancreas is both an exocrine gland, one that releases secretions into a duct or channel, and an endocrine gland, one that releases substances directly into the bloodstream. As an endocrine organ, it produces the hormones insulin and glucagon. See chapter 51. As an exocrine organ, it produces various protein, fat, and carbohydrate digesting enzymes. At the appropriate time for digestion, the pancreatic enzymes are released in inactive forms and transported to the duodenum where they are activated. Risk factors. Patterns of elimination change in the first few years of life. Infants and toddlers initially lack control over the sphincters and muscles that control urination and bowel elimination, but control is attained during early childhood as a normal developmental milestone. Children are typically 18 to 24 months of age before they are able to identify the urge to urinate and defecate. Toilet training by the parent or caregiver helps the child contain, obtain conscious control of his or her bowel and bladder functions. Pregnant women. Pregnancy can affect elimination patterns because the presence of the fetus 
in the abdominal cavity affects both bowel and bladder function. As the fetus grows, increased pressure is placed on the bladder and frequent urination is required. The woman will have larger volumes of urine because she has a larger blood volume during the gestation. The growing, growing fetus can also interfere with intestinal peristalsis and can cause constipation. The use of prenatal vitamins with iron can also contribute to constipation in the pregnant female. Older adults. A number of physiological changes associated with aging elimination affect elimination. By age 80, renal blood flow reduces to an estimated 600 milliliters per minute and the kidneys lose up to 50% of functioning nephrons for a variety of reasons, including changes in the size of the kidney and sclerosis. In the absence of disease, this does not change the older adult's ability to produce urine sufficiently to maintain normal composition of body fluids, although it represents reduced renal reserve, making the older adult more susceptible to fluid and electrolyte imbalances and kidney damage due to medications. Although the bladder retains tone with age, the volume of urine that can be held reduces, leading to urinary frequency. In many older adults, muscles around the urethra become weak, thus increasing the risk of incontinence. Age-related changes affecting bowel elimination include atrophy of smooth muscle layers in the colon and reduced mu mucus secretions, reduced tone of the internal and external sphincter as well as reduced neural impulses, reducing the sensation of bowel evacuation, can make the older adult more susceptible to constipation or incontinence. Physiologic consequences of incontinence, loss of control, involuntary release of urine or feces, diarrhea, loss of sphincter control leads to skin breakdown, changes in daily activities, and changes in social relationships. Bowel incontinence. Bowel incontinence is the involuntary passage of stool and ranges from an occasional leakage of stool while passing gas or flatus to a complete loss of bowel control. Bowel incontinence can occur with diarrhea, particularly when it is associated with forceful intestinal peristalsis and cramping. Complete incontinence usually occurs from a loss of sphincter control, usually as a result of traumatic injury, pathologic changes to the rectum, or from neurologic injury. Changes and or loss of cognition can also result in bowel incontinence. Retention. Retention refers to the unintentional retention of urine or stool and can occur at any age. The primary mechanisms causing retention are usually associated with obstructions, inflammation, or infective neuromuscular activation within the bladder or the GI tract. Urinary retention. Urinary retention occurs as either incomplete emptying of the bladder after urination or a complete inability to urinate and is caused by a number of factors. Incomplete emptying can occur due to malfunction in nervous system innervation to the bladder or mechanical change in the shape of the bladder that causes retention. For example, women may experience urinary retention if there is hard stool that presses against the bladder or rectoceles or cystoceles that cause prolapse of the bladder and trapping of urine. Retention can also occur when an obstruction blocks the passage of urine, such as an enlarged prostate, or when the external sphincter of the bladder does not relax, allowing the urine to be expelled from the bladder. Medications that may cause urinary retention include antidepressants, anticholinergics, and antihistamines. Postoperative patients may have problems with urinary elimination as a result of the effects of anesthetics or the use of catheters during the surgical procedure. Psychosocial factors such as fear or anxiety may also affect the ability to successfully void. Retention of stool. Stool retention occurs when the person is unable to pass the stool successfully from the rectum. This condition is not normal for the young, but it may occur if the urge to defecate is ignored and stool becomes difficult to eliminate. Stool retention may occur as a side effect to many medications, including narcotic pain medications. Stool retention usually results in constipation, defined as the difficult passage of hard, dry stool, 
Ongoing retention of stool causes loss of appetite, discomfort, and potentially fecal impaction. Discomfort. The process of elimination should normally be free of pain or discomfort. In the case of significant urgency, the process of elimination can actually relieve discomfort. The most common causes for urinary discomfort are associated with inflammation, often associated with infection of the urinary tract, or bladder distension associated with urinary retention. Pain associated with urinary tract infection is often described as a burning pain. Pain can also be associated with irritation when urine comes in contact with lesions on the genitalia. Discomfort associated with bowel elimination can be associated with passage of hard stool, inflammation or injury to the anus, the presence of hemorrhoids, both internal and external, infection, or irritation of the intestinal lining attributable to frequent passage of stool. In children, there can be telescoping of the bowel back onto itself called intraception that can result in abdominal pain from obstruction and retention of stool. Chronic conditions such as colitis or irritable bowel syndrome and excessive flatus can also be painful. Bowel irritability that is characterized especially by constipation or diarrhea, cramping abdominal pain, and the passage of mucus in the stool can cause discomfort. Pain also can be associated with lesions such as an anal fissure or hemorrhoids. Infections and inflammation. Elimination problems also can be caused by inflammatory or infectious conditions. Infection in the urinary system is often retur retur referred to as urinary tract infection, but specific structures in the urinary system can become inflamed or infected, including the kidney, called nephritis, the renal pelvis, called pyelonephritis, and the bladder, called cystitis. Acute intestinal inflammation and infection are most commonly associated with viral infections or food poisoning. Chronic inflammatory conditions of the intestinal tract include colitis and diverticulitis, and these are associated with severe abdominal pain, discomfort, and nutritional deficits. Neoplasms. Neoplasms are tumors and can have an effect on urinary and bowel elimination. Benign and malignant neoplasms of the prostate often lead to blockage of urinary flow in men. Tumors can also occur in the kidney or bladder, but these are less common. Neoplasms in the intestinal tract are also common and include benign growths such as polyps and cancerous lesions in the intestine, colon, or rectum. Organ failure. One additional category of problems related to elimination is organ failure. The most obvious organ that comes to mind is the kidney. Renal failure can occur suddenly, usually associated with an injury to the kidney, referred to as acute kidney injury, or it can occur as a slow chronic process, referred to as chronic kidney disease, whereby the kidneys lose functional capacity over months to years. The inability to remove metabolic waste and fluid creates significant physiological challenges. The failure of other key organs such as the heart, the liver, and the pancreas also hampers elimination efforts. For example, heart failure and shock reduce blood flow to the kidneys and GI system, thereby reducing the efficiency of urine production and removal as well as formation of stool. Removal of the small or large intestines because of injury or disease also results in significant changes in elimination. A number of consequences occur associated with impaired elimination processes and are linked to an underlying problem. Consequences associated with incontinence range from potential for skin breakdown and falls, if associated with urgency, to social lifestyle and relationship consequences and depression and withdrawal. The consequences of urinary retention include pain, chronic bladder infections, and a bladder distension. Bladder distension can lead to urinary reflux which is a backflow of urine from the bladder into the ureters, causing dilation of the ureters and renal pelvis and can lead to polyonephritis and renal atrophy. The complete loss of renal function, referred to as renal failure, represents significant physiological consequences. The inability to remove toxins and metabolic waste results in fluid and electrolyte and acid-base disturbances and leads to death if untreated. Bowel retention leads to constipation, 
pain, loss of appetite, nausea, and vomiting. An alias refers to a loss of peristaltic activity in the gastrointestinal tract. This can occur subsequent to abdominal trauma or surgery and is associated with nausea, vomiting, and distension. Although rare, rupture of the colon can occur, representing a life-threatening situation. Risk factors. Because elimination represents normal physiological function, this concept applies to all individuals and problems with the elimination of urine and stool and can affect any person regardless of age, gender, or race. Risk factors for altered urinary elimination. Populations at risk for urinary incontinence include children younger than three, the elderly, pregnant women, and women who are menopausal. The prevalence of urinary incontinence ranges from 19% in women aged 45 years or younger to 49% in women aged 80 or older. Men are more likely to experience urination difficulties as they age because of changes called hyperplasia in the prostate gland that may cause either urinary retention or increased urinary frequency due to incomplete emptying of the bladder. There are many reasons why incontinence increases with ages in both genders, including pelvic floor, muscle weakness in women, and neurologic problems in men. Medications such as diuretics can also contribute to the involuntary loss of urine in both men and women. Individual risk factors include conditions that result in neurologic impairment, altered mobility, cognitive impairment, and immunological impairment or infection. Persons with trauma to the brain or spinal cord may experience bladder and bowel impairment attributable to interruption of bowel and bladder innervation by the spinal cord. If messages cannot be sent along the nervous system pathways, the anus and bladder are unable to function normally. Several medical conditions can place an individual at risk for alterations in urinary elimination, including cerebrovascular accidents, such as called CVAs, spinal cord injuries, diabetic neuropathy, dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, and AIDS or other autoimmune diseases. Conditions that are specific to the urinary system are urinary calculi, or stones, enlarged prostate, called benign prostatic hypertrophy, acute infection, and chronic infections. Some congenital defects can impair urinary elimination function, such as defects of the spinal cord or brain and bladder defects. Risk factors for altered bowel elimination, bowel or fecal incontinence occurs in approximately 8% or 18 million Americans. Bowel problems occur in men and women from both acute neurologic injury and progressive neurologic changes with advanced age. Excessive use of medications such as laxatives can contribute to incontinence issues in both genders. Persons at high risk for incontinence are those with cognitive impairment, those who are exposed to radiation for treatment purposes, and those who take multiple medications, consume excessive amounts of caffeine, or have limited access to toilet facilities because of immobility or environmental or sociocultural factors. Risk factors that place individuals at risk for stool retention, including lack of adequate fluids, fiber or exercise, as well as use of medications that dry the system, such as diuretics, narcotics, antidepressants, or anxiolytics. Pregnancy increases risk for stool retention because of the pressure of the fetus on the bowel. Many medical conditions can place an individual at risk for alterations in bowel elimination, including CVAs, strokes, spinal cord injury, diabetic neuropathy, dementia, including Alzheimer's, and AIDS or other autoimmune diseases. Some conditions specific to the GI system associated with risk include irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, and food allergies or intolerance such as celiac disease. Several congenital defects impair bowel elimination function such as defects of the spinal cord or brain, colon, and rectal defects. GI health. Assessment. Assessment of elimination includes taking a history, conducting a physical exam, and performing diagnostic testing when problems are identified. History. Conducting a history is the first step to understanding problems associated with elimination. Ask about patterns of urinary and bowel elimination, including frequency, appearance of stool and urine, and associated symptoms. Common symptoms directly related to elimination include alteration in elimination patterns, changes in the appearance, frequency, or quality of stool or urine, 
or discomfort and difficulty associated with elimination. A symptom analysis approach is helpful to fully understand the symptom. Determine if there has been changes in diet, recent changes in health status such as cognition, mobility, functional ability, or other medical conditions, and if there are new medications or changes in medications. Voluntary or involuntary incontinence, emptying of the bowel or bladder, also must be assessed to determine the impact of the condition on the individual. Adults of all ages should be asked about urinary continence because it is an underreported phenomenon. Examination findings. Physical assessment incorporates four examination techniques, inspection, auscultation, palpation, and percussion. Inspection. The abdomen is inspected for contour. Abdominal or bladder distension is an abnormal finding. The genitalia are also inspected to examine the urinary meatus for evidence of redness, lesions, or discharge. Discharge from the urinary meatus is an abnormal finding and may suggest infection, especially if the patient reports pain with voiding. Observe the perineal anal area. The area should be free from redness or lesions. The presence of hemorrhoids or an anal fistula may be observed if the client complains of pain with defecation. Inspection also includes looking at a stool or urine sample if available. Urine should be clear and yellow with a mild odor. Very dark urine may be indicative of dehydration, may be a side effect of medication, or may indicate the presence of stool. Stools should be brown and formed. Stools that are black and tarry in appearance often signal GI bleeding. Loose stools or diarrhea may be associated with diet, inflammation, or infection. Auscultation is limited to the abdomen to listen to bowel sounds. Bowel sounds should be heard in all four quadrants. An absence of bowel sounds may be associated with peri paralytic ileus. Hyperactive bowel sounds may be noted with GI inflammation or with an intestinal obstruction. Auscultation is not indicated in urinary assessment. For uh, bowel sounds, you should hear bowel sounds every 5 to 20 seconds, and you need to listen 3 to 5 minutes on each quadrant to confirm any absence of sounds. Palpation. Abdominal palpation is a physical exam technique for both urinary and bowel elimination. The abdomen should be soft and non-tender with palpation over the entire abdomen and over the urinary bladder. Abdominal or urinary distension is considered an abnormal finding and may be associated with reduced peristalsis or retention of stool or urine. Rectal palpation is done to assess the rectal sphincter and to examine for the presence of masses, lesions, or impacted stool. Digital palpation is also part of the prostate exam. Although this is not directly an exam associated with elimination, prostate enlargement can result from a tumor, benign or malignant, or inflammation both can contribute to urinary retention. Percussion. Abdominal percussion may be performed to help identify masses or excessive intestinal gas. Direct, direct fist percussion over the costal retrieval angle over the kidney on the back should be painless. If sharp pain is produced, it could signal the presence of a kidney infection. Diagnostic tests. There are a number of tests associated with elimination. In general, the diagnostic tests are classified into one of three categories, lab, radio, radiographic, and direct observation. Lab tests. Urinalysis. A urinalysis is one of the most common of all lab tests. It is useful for screening a number of conditions not associated with a problem in elimination and is obtained with either a sterile urine specimen or a clean catch specimen. Bacteria indicate infection, whereas blood may indicate damage from infection or trauma to the urinary system. Urinary analysis that indicates the presence of bacteria or blood components in the urine may require further assessment of the urinary tract by a physician specialized in the field of urology. Renal function tests. Laboratory tests assessing renal function include blood, urea, nitrogen, blood, creatinine, and creatinine clearance tests. Creatinine and blood urea nitrogen are excreted entirely by the kidneys and therefore provide a measure of renal function. Culture. Urine and stool cultures are relatively common lab tests. When a urinary tract infection is suspected, a urine culture determines the presence and type of organism causing the urinary infection. 
Stool cultures are indicated when a parasitic infection is suspected. Occult blood. When blood is suspected in stool, an occult blood test is indicated. It also represents a basic screening that should be performed as part of a rectal exam. The presence of blood in the stool could be related to a GI bleed, inflammation and infection, hemorrhoids, or tumors. Pathology. A biopsy is a sample of tissue or cells that undergoes pathologic evaluation. A biopsy can be taken from the rectum, colon, bladder, or kidneys. Biopsies provide information associated with tumors or with general organ function. Radiographic tests and scans. Numerous radiographic tests are used to assess illumination. Common radiographic tests include x-rays, CTs, MRIs, and ultrasound. These are used to detect a variety of problems, including the presence of an intestinal tumor, a congenital renal abnormality, or kidney stones. Angiography is used to assess renal blood flow and can detect renal artery stenosis. Direct observation tests. The ability to directly observe internal organs can be accomplished with scopes. With, re with regard to the concept of elimination, scopes can be used to visualize the colon, colonoscopy, the sigmoid colon, sigmoidoscopy, the bladder, cystoscopy, or the urethra or ureters, uroscopy. Direct visualization of the colon is done for screening or diagnostic purposes for polyps, cancer, and inflammatory conditions such as Crohn's disease. Direct visualization of the bladder or ureters is done with a special scope as part of a diagnostic or surgical procedure. Other diagnostic tests. Several special tests are available to evaluate urinary elimination, including bladder stress testing, urophlometry, and other urine flow studies and post-yield residual measurement through the use of bladder scans or post-void catheterization. Barium swallows or upper GI series are also used for fluoroscopy uh, observation of the esophagus to identify structural abnormalities of the esophagus, swallowing dysfunction, and oral aspiration. Is the following statement true or false? Upper gastrointestinal series identifies structural abnormalities of the esophagus swallowing dysfunction and oral aspiration. The answer is true. Upper GI series identifies structural abnormalities of the esophagus swallowing dysfunction and oral aspiration. Barium swallows or an upper GI series. This procedure involves a fluoroscopic study of the entire upper GI tract. Barium sulfate is a radiopaque solution used as the contrast agent. A thin barium solution such as hypake may be used instead. Both are sweetened and flavored but have a chalky taste. Clients are asked to drink 12 to 14 ounces. As this contrast solution moves through the digestive tract, a fluoroscope is held over the part of the body being examined. Images of the esophagus, stomach, and part of the upper intestine are visualized on a monitor. The test diagnoses, diagnoses structural abnormalities in the esophagus such as tumors, strictures, varices, and hiatal hernias. Structural abnormal, abnormal findings below the esophagus include gastric tumors, peptic ulcers, and numerous gastric disorders. A barium swallow Enterocleisis, also known as small bowel enema, requires nasal or oral placement of a flexible feeding tube, the tip of which is positioned in the proximal jejunum. This study uses two contrast media, first 750 to 1000 milliliters of a thin barium suspension infused through the tube, followed by a 750 to 1000 milliliters of methyl cellulose. The two contrast media fill in and pass through the intestinal loops. The examiner observes the intestine continuously by fluoroscopy and takes periodic x-rays of the various sections of the small intestine. Even with normal motility, this proce procedure can take up to six hours. If sedation is administered to ensure the client's comfort, he or she requires monitoring accordingly. 
the risk that the contrast media may be aspirated is increased if the client vomits while under sedation. Therefore, positioning of the client on his or her side and availability of a suction apparatus is critical. Barium enema or lower GI series. A barium enema or lower GI series is used to identify polyps, tumors, inflammation, strictures, and other abnormalities of the colon. It is performed in the radiology department. The radiographic technologist instills 1,000 to 1,500 milliliters of barium solution rectally. He or she observes the rectum, sigmoid colon, and descending colon, colon flora, fluoroscopically during filling. Fluoroscopically during filling. To facilitate this process, the examiner directs the client to make multiple position changes. The client must retain the barium during this test, which may take up to 30 minutes. During the test, the client may experience abdominal cramping and a strong urge to defecate. The nurse reassures the client that most people can retain the instilled barium enema throughout the test. X-rays are taken again after the client expels the barium. In some cases, air is instilled to compress the barium residue against the wall of the lower intestine to aid in detecting mucosal defects. Stool specimens are not collected until the barium has been expelled completely. To reduce the formation of stool and remove any residual stool, the client follows prescribed restrictions and procedures 24 to 48 hours before the barium enema. Low residue diet, one to two days before the test, clear liquid diet the evening before the test, a laxative the evening before the test, NPO after midnight, cleansing enemas the morning of the test if not contraindicated by inflammation or active bleeding. The amount of fluids is not restricted and the client usually does not have to withhold oral medications. The client may have up to three cleansing enemas or until the evacuated solution appears clear before the procedure. After the examination is complete, the client may resume eating. The nurse encourages the client to rest and to drink fluids liberally. He or she also monitors the passage of stool and informs the client that feces will appear white until the barium is completely eliminated. Oral cholecystography or gallbladder series. Ultrasonography has mostly replaced oral cystography or gallbladder series. It is easier and quicker to perform and is as accurate as the other tests. It also has the benefit of not exposing clients to more radiation. In addition, ultrasound can be safely used for clients with liver disease and jaundice. However, if it is not available or ultrasound tests were not conclusive, cholecystography can be used to identify stones in the gallbladder or common bile duct and tumors or other obstructions. The test also deter determines the ability of the gallbladder to concentrate and store a dye-like iodine-based radiopaque contrast medium. After the dye is absorbed, it goes to the liver, it's excreted into the bile and passes into the gallbladder, making it radiographically visible. Radiography of the gallbladder should be performed before other GI examinations in which barium is used because residual barium tends to obscure the image of the gallbladder and its ducts. Instructions before the procedure vary, but generally a client is asked to eat a fat-free meal the night before the test. It's important to ask the client whether he or she is allergic to iodine. Under the direction of a physician, the client swallows six iodine-containing contrast tablets, one every five minutes, 10 to 12 hours before the procedure with a total of 250 milliliters of water or more. After the client ingests the contrast agent, he or she needs to be MPO and may not eat or drink until after the test is done. If the contrast dye causes nausea and vomiting, the client or nurse needs to notify the physician so that more tablets can be ordered or the test rescheduled. Once the initial x-rays are obtained, a fatty test meal or fatty synthetic substance may be given to stimulate gallbladder contraction and emptying. Additional x-rays are taken to determine the gallbladder's ability to empty. Cholangiography. Performed in the radiology department or during surgery, cholangiography determines the patency of the ducts from the liver and gallbladder. It is used when the gallbladder is not distinctly visualized with an oral cholecystogram. Vomiting interferes with the retention of the oral dye or the status of the ductal system needs to be determined during or after surgery. There are four specific types of cholangiography. 
endoscopic retrograde coleangiography performed in the radiology department or during surgery coleangiography determines the patency of the ducts from the liver and gallbladder it's used when the gallbladder is not distinctly visualized with an oral system cholecystogram vomiting interferes with retention of the oral dye or the status of the ductal system needs to be determined before or after surgery during or after surgery there are four specific types of cholangiography endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography abbreviated ERCP with the use of endoscopy dyes injected through a catheter into the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct direct visualization is accomplished with a flexible fiber optic endoscope it is inserted into the esophagus through the stomach into the descending duodenum the client is asked to change positions frequently in order to move the endo endoscope in addition fluoroscopy and multiple x-rays are required Intraoperative cholangiography. The contrast agent is injected directly into the bile duct during gallbladder surgery. Magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography, MRCP. This newer technique for visualizing the bile ducts, the pancreatic duct, and the gallbladder does not use contrast dye, but rather MRI, thus obtaining computerized images. These images provide clear and detailed views. Percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography angiography, PTC, ultrasound is used to guide a needle into the bile ducts so that water-soluble contrast agents, agent can be directed inje injected into the biliary system. This procedure is safe for clients with liver disease and jaundice. It's used for clients with jaundice caused by liver disease, for clients with GI symptoms who do not have a gallbladder to locate stones within the bile ducts or to diagnose cancer within the biliary system. A flexible needle is inserted into the liver ultrasound assists the physician in guiding puncture of the bile duct if a contrast agent is used no matter how it is introduced it spreads into the biliary biliary system x-rays are then taken to show narrowing or blockages within the biliary system allergy to shellfish may signal risk for a reaction to intravenous contrast study shows the link between shellfish and iodine allergy is no greater than other food allergies yet it should always be investigated before a procedure Endoscope retrograde cholangio pancreatography. When educating a client preparing to undergo an endoscopic retrograde, retrograde cholangio pancreatography, ERCP, the most important point for the nurse to emphasize is that the client's cooperation will be needed to change positions frequently throughout the procedure in order to prevent injuring the GI tract. For this exam, the client must sign a consent form. As part of the agreement, if the client is having an ERCP, the client must understand that his or her cooperation is essential. If a contrast agent is going to be used, the nurse asks the client if he or she is allergic to iodine or shellfish. Clients having a PTC need to know how they will fast before the procedure and will have moderate sedation. Clients having a PTC which is the percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography, are at risk for bleeding and infection. Therefore, coagulation studies and platelet counts are done. Clients also receive antibiotics during and after the procedure. Clients are repositioned frequently on the fluoroscopy table to enable multiple x-rays from different views. Remember, this one is an ultrasound uh, examining the bile ducts and um, this is for locating stones within the bile ducts or to diagnose cancer within the biliary system. Before the procedure, the nurse checks physician orders to determine if the client needs a cleansing enema. It may also be necessary to restrict food and fluids for several hours before the procedure. The nurse informs the client that he or she may experience a warm sensation and nausea when the contrast agent is instilled. After the procedure, the client may eat and drink. To promote dye excretion, the nurse encourages the client to drink liberally. Radionuclide imaging. Radionuclide imaging detects lesions of the liver or pancreas and assists in evaluating gastric emptying. A, radio, a radionuclide is a radioactive natural or synthetic element such as technetium. Once the radionuclide is injected intravenously or ingested orally, 
The radiologist may examine a body organ by passing the radionuclide imaging scanner over the structure. This test is helpful in demonstrating the size of the organ as well as defects or lesions such as tumors. Specialized radionuclide studies are done to identify sites of bleeding or inflammation in the GI tract. Radionuclides have sh rather short half-lives lasting a few hours to days during which they emit radiation which is usually less than with diagnostic radiography. Pretest measures include weighing the client to calculate the radionuclide dose and determining pregnancy and lactation. Breast milk may be pumped and discarded so that the nursing child remains safe from radioactivity. The test is contraindicated in pregnant women. Computed tomography. CT scanning may be performed to detect structural abnormalities of the GI tract. These tests help detect metastatic lesions that might not be apparent on regular GI x-rays. Oral barium sulfate or IV calcium phosphate may be given to provide contrast for the hollow GI organs examined by CT scan. The client is MPO for six to eight hours before the CT test. Before the test, the bowel may be cleansed to reduce stool and gas. Drugs may be administered to decrease peristalsis or improve gastric motility. Continuous motion, helical or spherical, three-dimensional CT scans enable examiners to have detailed pictures of GI organs and vessels. This procedure is referred to as colonography. Clients are prepared as they are for CT scanning. A small tube is inserted into the colon, air is introduced to inflate the colon, and computer images are produced. Magnetic resonance imaging. MRI uses magnetic energy rather than radiation to visualize soft tissue structures. It's used to examine GI structures when CT scanning is inadequate. Oral contrast agents are used to enhance the evaluation of GI disorders such as abscesses or bleeding. The client is NPO for six to eight hours before the MRI. He or she must remove any metal objects, credit cards, wristwatches, jewelry, and the like. Clients with pacemakers may need a cardiology consult before the MRI to determine if there are any risks or contraindications. IV fluids, if required, must be infused by gravity during MRI because the changes in electrical charges during the test can affect mechanical infusers or pumps. The nurse informs clients that the scanner, a narrow tunnel-like machine that will enclose them during the test, makes loud repetitive noises while the test is in progress. Clients who are claustrophobic, fear of enclosed spaces, may need sedation because it is imperative that they lie still and not panic during the test. Magnetic resonance elastography. Magnetic resonance elastography, MRE, a new non-invasive methodology developed by physicians at the Mayo Clinic, combines MRI with low-frequency sound waves, referred to as shear waves. The resulting images enable physicians to ascertain the firmness of the liver, thus allowing them to better predict clients who are at risk for developing fibrous scar tissue and eventually cirrhosis hardening of the liver. If detected early, treatment of the underlying cause can be initiated before the client develops cirrhosis, which is an irreversible and eventually fatal condition. Physicians previously could only rely on palpation, which is inconclusive, or a liver biopsy, which is diagnostic only for a small portion of the liver and very invasive, with risk of bleeding. MRE shows great promise for other parts of the body, such as breasts, muscles, and brain tissue. Ultrasonography, also called ultrasound, high-frequency sound waves are directed through the body where they bounce off nearby structures, such as the liver and pancreas. The returning sound waves are then interpreted and recorded electronically. Ultrasonography, which shows the size and location of organs and outline structures and abnormalities, helps detect cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, pyloric stenosis, and some disorders of the biliary system. It may be useful in detecting changes caused by appendicitis. Although the client can drink water before ultrasonography, the nurse discourages drinking through a, a straw, smoking, or chewing gum. In these activities, the client may swallow air and thereby distort sound wave transmission. Endoscopic ultrasonography uses a fiber optic scope with a small high-frequency ultrasonic transducer to obtain direct images of specific areas along the GI tract. The images have higher resolution and help in staging tumors and evaluating changes in the intestinal walls.
percutaneous liver biopsy. In a procedure called percutaneous liver biopsy, C44.4, on page 766 in Timby, the physician obtains a small core of liver tissue by placing a needle through the client's lateral abdominal wall directly into the liver. The tissue is then examined microscopically to detect abnormalities which may include malignant changes, infectious or inflammatory processes, liver damage such as cirrhosis and signs of rejection in clients who have received a liver transplant. Although the procedure is most often performed in the hospital operating room, it may be done in a physician's office or other outpatient site or in a radiology department. The client must have coagulation studies before the procedure because a major complication after a liver biopsy is bleeding. Ultrasound or CT scanning is performed before or during the biopsy to identify an appropriate site for placement of the biopsy needle. The client usually receives a sedative and anesthetic to promote comfort and cooperation. All anticoagulant medications, including non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, should be stopped three days to one week before liver biopsy. Clients with bleeding conditions, such as hemophilia, may be given an intramuscular injection of vitamin K before the procedure. When assisting with a percutaneous liver biopsy, the nurse ensures that the biopsy equipment is assembled in, in order. He or she helps the client assume a supine position with a rolled towel beneath the right lower lip, ribs. Before the physician inserts the needle, the nurse instructs the client to take a deep breath and hold it to keep the liver as near to the abdominal wall as possible. After specimen cells are obtained, they are placed in a preservative. The nurse makes sure that the specimen container is labeled and delivered to the laboratory. Assisting with a percutaneous liver biopsy, nursing guidelines 44.1 on page 767 in Timby. Explain that the purpose of the procedure is to obtain a small sample of liver tissue for a differential diagnosis of liver disease or to evaluate the extent of liver disease. Check the results of coagulation studies, A, P, 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 T, P, T, I, N, R, and platelet count. Check that the informed consent form has been signed. Instruct the client to lie supine with the right arm behind the head. Tell the client that the site will be cleansed and then draped with a sterile barrier. The physician will insert the will instruct the client to take a deep breath and hold it while the needle is introduced, sample obtained, and needle withdrawn. This takes only a few seconds. Monitor vital signs throughout the procedure. Place the pressure dressing over the biopsy site. Assist the client to lie on the right side after the procedure and place a small pillow under the costal margin. Instruct the client to remain in this position for at least two hours to prevent the release of blood, bile, or both. Instruct the client that he or she should remain in bed for 8 to 12 hours except to go to the bathroom. The client should avoid coughing or straining during this time. Continue to monitor vital signs. Changes in vital signs may indicate bleeding. Monitor the biopsy site frequently for bleeding, swelling, or hematoma. Assess breath sounds regularly. Report diminished breath sounds immediately. Assess the abdomen for distension or rigidity. Report if the client is experiencing abdominal pain. Instruct the client to avoid heavy lifting and strenuous activity for five to seven days after the procedure. Instruct the client to follow physician's orders for blood thinning medications. Instruct the client to call if he or she experiences the following symptoms. Severe pain at the biopsy site, shortness of breath, chest pain, bleeding from the biopsy site, fever, abdominal pain, weakness or diaphoresis, which is sweating, and heart palpitations. Gastrointestinal endoscopy. GI endoscopy is the direct visual examination of the lumen of the GI tract. It facilitates evaluation of the appearance and integrity of the GI mucosa and detects lesions. It provides access for therapeutic procedures. GI endoscopy is performed using a flexible fiber optic endoscope. Diagnostic studies include obtaining biopsies of the mucosa, obtaining samples of fluids found in the GI tract, and injecting dyes for radiographic purposes. Therapeutic uses include inserting tubes and drains, electrocautery, and injecting medications. Among the variations of GI endoscopy, see box 44.1, are proctosigmoidoscopy, esophagastroduodenoscopy, EGD, small bowel enteroscopy, peritone peritoneoscopy, colonoscopy, virtual colonoscopy, flexible sigmoidoscopy, and pen endoscopy. All these are described in figure 44.1.
uh, common GI endoscopic procedures on page 768 in Tempe. Before an endoscopic procedure, the client follows dietary and fluid restrictions and bowel preparation procedures. Clear visualization of internal structures is important during endoscopic procedures. A clear liquid diet a number of hours before a procedure may suffice for viewing structures from the mouth to a portion of the small intestine. Viewing the lower bowel often requires cleansing, typically with laxatives. This is frequently done at home and may be taken orally as pill or large volume solutions. Emptying of the rectum may require enema solutions as well. The goal is to evacuate all intestinal contents. Instruct clients to call before the procedure if they feel evacuation of all contents was unsuccessful. The procedure may be rescheduled when visualization is better. Before the procedure, the client follows dietary and fluid restrictions and bowel prep procedures if the examination involves the lower GI structures. For the client undergoing an EGD, it is necessary for the client to spray or gargle with a local anesthetic. For an EGD and a colonoscopy, the client receives an anxiolytic agent such as metazolam, which is called Versed, before the procedure to provide sedation and relieve anxiety. Clients having these procedures must have someone drive them to and from the procedure site because they should not drive until the day after the procedure. During an endoscopy procedure, the nurse monitors respirations and vital signs. Assessing the client's level of pain and discomfort during the procedure is important, as is medicating the client as indicated. After the test, the nurse assesses the client's vital signs, respiratory status, level of consciousness, and abdominal symptoms. The nurse monitors the client for complications, especially signs of perforation. These include fever, abdominal distension, abdominal or chest pain, vomiting blood, or bright red rectal bleeding. The nurse offers the client light food and fluids unless the procedure was an EGD. After an EGD, the client may not have food or fluids until the gag reflex returns. Once the gag reflex is present, the nurse may introduce clear fluids and advance the diet to regular foods and fluids according to the client's tolerance. Occasionally, the client may complain of a sore throat after EGD. If the client's gag reflex has returned, the nurse may offer saline gargles, ice chips, or cool drinks. Client and Family Teaching 44-1, page 767, outlines discharge instructions following a colonoscopy. Laboratory Tests Oh, liver, liver biopsy. Lie on the right side for two hours, stay in bed for eight to 12 hours post uh, liver biopsy, check vital signs, monitor for bleeding, swelling, or hematoma, and monitor breath sounds. You're looking for perforation of any area. Laboratory tests. Depending on the suspected or confirmed diagnosis, various blood and urine tests may be ordered. Laboratory tests may include a CBC, complete blood count, urinalysis, UA, serum bilirubin, cholesterol, serum ammonia level, prothrombin time, protein electrophoresis, and enzymes such as amylase, lipase, aspartate, amino transferase, and lactic acid dehydrogenase. Common tumor marker blood studies include carcinoembryonic antigen and alpha fetoprotein. Tests specific to the GI system are described in the following sections. Gastroanalysis, analysis of gastric fluids assist in determining problems with the secretory activity of the gastric mucosa. It also helps evaluate gastric retention in clients who have partial or complete pyloric or duodenal obstruction. For 8 to 12 hours before the test, the client is MPO. A small nasogastric tube is inserted into the stomach. Gastric contents are aspirated every 15 minutes for at least an hour and analyzed for acidity or pH volume, and cytology if indicated. Tests for H. pylori. Helobacter pylori, a type of bacteria, are believed to be responsible for the majority of peptic ulcers. Gastric mucosal specimens obtained during an endoscopy are cultured for H. pylori. Blood tests are used to determine whether there are antibodies to H. pylori in the blood. Urea breath tests are also used to test for the active infection from H. pylori. The client either drinks a urea solution or swallows a urea capsule. Breath tests are then conducted by having the client blow up a small balloon or by blowing bubbles in a small container of breath collection fluid. 
If H. pylori bacteria are present, they break down the urea, releasing carbon. The blood carries the air to the lungs where it is exhaled and the air is analyzed. During and after therapy, the H. pylori stool antigen, HPSA, test is done to determine the effectiveness of treatment. Breath hydrogen test. This test involves collecting a breath sample before and at intervals after ingestion of a carbohydrate solution used with glucose tolerance tests. The two major gases in expired air are hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Elevated hydrogen levels in the expired breath sample indicate carbohydrate malabsorption. The type of solution used for the test depends on the suspected type of malabsorption. Lactose malabsorption, lactose intolerance, is the most common disorder investigated using this technique. Stool analysis. Stool specimens are collected to identify white blood cells indicating inflammation, red blood cells indicating GI blood loss, and fat indicating malabsorption. They are also collected to identify infection. Only a small amount of stool needs to be collected. Samples should always be placed in a covered container. To examine for microorganisms, specimens should be fresh and warm. Routine cultures may reveal bacterial infections such as Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, and placement of the specimen in a specific preservative is to detect parasites and their ova allows diagnosis of parasitic infections such as Giardia and Cryptosporidium. A simple test that determines the presence of occult blood in the stool is the hemocult test. A positive result indicates that the client is bleeding or has recently bled from somewhere in the GI tract. Substances that may cause false positive results include red meat, iodine-containing antiseptic preparations, aspirin greater than 325 milligrams per day, and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents and excessive alcohol. Substances that may cause false negative results include ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, greater than 250 milligrams per day, and iron supplements. After a liver biopsy, how many hours should a patient stay in bed? 1 to 4 hours, 4 to 8, 8 to 12, or 12 to 16? The answer is 8 to 12 hours. After a liver biopsy, a patient should stay in bed for 8 to 12 hours. Clinical management with um, prevention of problems with elimination include hydration, especially for bowel uh, problems, hydration, adequate dietary fiber, regular toileting practices, regular exercise, and avoidance of environmental contamination. The environmental factors uh, is to avoid contaminated water and foods that can assist in maintaining um, consistent bowel habits. Um, bacteria in water or food can cause diarrhea and colitis. Parasites can be present in water or food that is not properly prepared. Parasites not only can cause elimination problems, but also can affect overall health. Lab testing can determine if parasites are present in the GI system that may be causing problems with bowel elimination. Maintaining hydration. Water is a key element for prevention of bowel and urinary elimination problems. Water is absorbed by the stool to soften it and promote intestinal motility, which assists in the elimination of stool. Water serves the urinary system in that it increases volume, reduces bladder irritation, and helps eliminate toxins from the body. Fluids that may create difficulty in both bowel and bladder elimination include those with caffeine, which may cause an increase in frequency of elimination. Any substances that irritate the bowel or bladder will cause alterations in normal elimination patterns. Dietary fiber. Fiber intake has been shown to assist in the prevention of stool retention, especially when implemented with adequate water intake and exercise. Fiber creates enough friction along the bowel surface that it can assist in the production of a bowel movement. Adequate fluid intake with the fiber is imperative. Fiber should be slowly added to the diet to prevent abdominal discomfort and excessive gas formation in the intestine. The American Dietetic Association recommends 14 grams of fiber per 1,000 kilocalorie cal intake. Maintenance of regular toileting practices. Maintaining a consistent time of defecation is important in the regulation of bowel movements. The use of familiar toileting facilities 
also encourages defecation. Avoidance of foods that cause discomfort during digestion and absorption or are known to cause constipation can help to maintain regular patterns of bowel elimination. To prevent urinary incontinence or retention, there should be timely and complete emptying of the bladder. Holding urine should be discouraged because this encourages bacterial growth in the bladder and consequently urinary tract infection. Screening. Colonoscopy screening. Two common screening tests associated with elimination are screening for occult blood and colonoscopy. Both are considered effective for the detection of colon cancer. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommends occult blood testing, sigmoidoscopy, or colonoscopy for adults beginning at age 50 until 75 years of age. These tests allow visualization of the colon and removal of precancerous lesions, averting the development of colon cancer. Screening for occult blood is performed annually or as a component of all digital rectal exams. Screening associated with urinary elimination includes prostate cancer screening, and the, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force does not recommend routine screening for bladder cancer. Collaborative interventions. Problems with elimination represent a wide range of conditions involving two major body systems the gastrointestinal system, and the urinary system. For the purposes of this concept, common interventions are only briefly described. Detailed information is available in various nursing textbooks. Pharmacologic agents. Antibiotics. Infections of the kidney and urinary tract are treated with antibiotics. Antibiotics are usually selected based on the provider's best judgment and based on the results of culture and sensitivity testing. Although a variety of agents are used, Trimethoprim, trimethoprim with sulfamethoxazole or nitroferantoin are common prescribed, commonly prescribed for urinary tract infections. Parental antibiotics are indicated for more severe infections such as polyonephritis. Antibiotics may also be used prophylactically with urinary retention or recurrent urinary tract infections. Diuretics. Diuretics increase the volume of urine produced along with excreting sodium and potassium from the body by affecting the water reabsorption in the renal tubules. Loop diuretics prevent reabsorption of sodium in the loop of Henle. Thiazide diuretics prevent sodium from being reabsorbed at the beginning of the distal convoluted tubules. Potassium, potassium sparing diuretics stop the extensive loss of potassium at the distal convoluted tubules. Excessive use to treat certain Conditions requires careful monitoring and frequent lab testing of the electrolytes. Antispasmodics. Anticholinergics are often used to relieve smooth muscle spasms in the bowel or bladder. Bladder spasms can occur as a consequence of neurologic injury. Anticholinergics can reduce bladder spasms and can provide relief from urinary incontinence. Bowel spasms commonly occur with irritable bowel, irritable bowel sp syndrome. Some antispasmodic medications such as Imodium, Loperamide, are effective for the treatment of diarrhea because they cause a reduction in peristalsis and slow the passage of stool. Agents to manage constipation. Pharmacologic management to treat stool retention includes both prescribed and over-the-counter versions of laxatives, bulk forming agents, bowel stimulants, lubricants, stool softeners, saline laxatives, and enemas. The drawback in using these medications is that the bowel can become dependent on laxatives and stimulants for the impulse to defecate. Medications for stool retention should be a last resort and discontinued as soon as the bowel elimination is achieved. Analgesics. Analgesics are indicated for relief of mild discomfort to severe pain for select urinary or bowel elimination conditions. Examples of conditions causing pain with elimination include kidney stones, cystitis, urinary tract infections, bladder spasms, hemorrhoids, and rectal fissures. Incontinence management. Multidisciplinary management of the person with alterations and elimination must occur in order to successfully control the condition. The need for retraining the bowel and bladder is of paramount importance. Providing a regular toileting schedule, managing fluid intake, modifying the environment, avoiding indwelling catheters, providing high quality skin care and assessment, and avoiding medications that contribute to incontinence are nursing actions that will promote urinary continence. 
Personal absorbent pads or bed protecting pads may be used to catch episodes of incontinence in both mobile and immobile individuals. Biofeedback may be used to assist the person in gaining improved control over the muscles of elimination. Biofeedback involves placement of sensors onto the affected area of bowel so that the person can receive feedback regarding which muscles are being used to control bowel function. Among those with dementia, toilet assistance including timed voiding and prompted voiding along with protective pads and skin care are standard interventions. Urinary invasive procedures and surgical interventions involving urinary elimination. A variety of procedures are performed as treatment for urinary elimination problems. The benefits must outweigh the risks for utilization of these interventions because they can be invasive and sometimes lifestyle altering procedures. Dialysis is indicated for acute or chronic renal failure it involves filtration of the blood to remove toxins through an external process. Two types of dialysis are hemodialysis and peritoneal. A dialysis machine is used in hemodialysis to filter a patient's blood to remove excess toxins in water. The blood is circulated from the patient to the dialysis machine and then back to the patient over several hours. In peritoneal dialysis, a dialysate solution is introduced into the peritoneal cavity that absorbs the toxins over several hours the solution and waste are then removed. Procedures relieving urinary retention. The most common procedure to relieve urinary retention is urinary catheterization. This can be in intermittently performed with a straight catheter or an indwelling catheter can be inserted. Measures must be taken to prevent complications such as infection when urinary drainage systems are used for long periods of time. Surgical intervention may be needed to treat other forms of obstructions including surgery on the bladder, prostate, or ureters. Many procedures are conducted through a cystoscope. Stents, which are rigid tubes that provide an opening that is not normally present, may be used internally in the urethra and externally as part of an anastomosis procedure performed for bladder cancer. Stents maintain the patency of pathways for urinary elimination. Renal calculi, renal calculi is known as kidney stones, often require surgical intervention if the stones are unable to pass through the urinary tract. A variety of surgical procedures are available to treat renal calculi, including lithotripsy, L-I-T-H-O-T-R-I-P-S-Y, fragmentation of the stones through sound wave technology, endourologic procedures, insertion of a uteroscope and crushing the stones with a surgical instrument called a lithro, right, or open procedures, nephrolithotomy, pileolithotomy, ureter, ureterolithotomy or cystotomy in which an incision is made and the stone is surgically removed. Nephrectomy. Occasionally surgical removal of the kidney is required as with renal cancer. Other conditions such as polycystic kidney disease may also require surgical intervention. Prostate surgery. An enlarged prostate can cause significant urinary obstruction. A transurethral resection of the prostate is a surgical procedure done for benign prostate hypertrophy when other non-invasive treatment measures have failed. Prostectomy refers to the removal of the prostate and is usually performed among younger men diagnosed with prostate cancer, particularly if diagnosed in early disease stage. Bladder surgeries. Surgical interventions of the bladder include a wide variety of procedures to treat many types of conditions such as prolapsed bladder or bladder cancer. Surgical treatment options include laser surgery, transurethral resection, and partial or total cystectomy. If the bladder is removed, urinary diversion is required. Urinary diversion. Urinary diversion procedures involve diverting the ure ureters to a urinary stoma on the skin, usually on the abdomen. There are multiple types of diversion procedures that are described in greater detail in many nursing textbooks. Urinary diversion is required with a cystectomy and is also used in the treatment of other conditions such as bladder cancer, neurogenic bladder, or trauma to the bladder. Maintenance of skin integrity at the stoma site is of great importance. External urinary pouches are used in many cases to collect urine in these types of situations. Invasive procedures and surgical interventions involving bowel elimination. Colectomy. A colectomy, also referred to as colon resection, involves removing a portion of the bowel. This may be done because of a disease to a portion of the bowel, a cancerous tumor, or as treatment for traumatic injury. The two ends of the colon are reattached. Colostomy, ileostomy. 
Diversion of the intestines, colon, or small intestine through a stoma on the skin is occasionally needed temporarily or permanently as a result of injured or diseased intestine, colon, or rectum. The use of external devices, such as a colostomy pouch, is required for the collection of stool. The, the maintenance of skin integrity around the stoma is of utmost importance. Rectal prolapse repair. Rectal prolapse is a condition that occurs when the rectum falls down into or through the anal opening. This is most common among young children and the elderly. Prolapse can occur from weak pelvic floor muscles or from excessive straining during bowel movements, as with chronic constipation. Surgical repair is indicated if prolapse occurs regularly or is associated with significant discomfort. Hemorrhectomy. This procedure re involves the excision of internal or external hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids may require surgical intervention if topical treatments and changes in diet do not eliminate their associated discomfort. Thus, the procedure is usually only performed for patients with severe pain and multiple thrombosed hemorrhoids or when there is significant prolapse. Fecal collection systems. A fecal collection system uses a flexible tube inserted into the rectum that is used to collect liquid stool in patients with incontinence who are not candidates for bowel retraining or have Clostridium difficile, C. diff, and its resulting diarrhea. These are fecal management systems for liquid stool only and help prevent skin breakdown in cases of severe diarrhea. Figure 17.4, Elimination and Interrelated Concepts. Nutrition, cognition, mobility, fluid and electrolytes, and acid-base balance all affect elimination. The maneuver that assists in passage of stool but may also stimulate the vagus nerve and cause bradycardia is called Barlow, Lachman, Leopold, or Valsalva. The answer to the prior slide is Valsalva maneuver. What is the key element for prevention of bowel and urinary elimination problems? Water, fiber, diuretics, or laxatives? Answer should be water is a key element for prevention of bowel and urinary elimination problems. Water is absorbed by the stool to soften it and promote intestinal motility. It also helps to flush the system and provides uh, urinary passage um, easier. Pain produced by percussion over the costal retrieval angle, which is on the posterior side, lower um, part of the back, may indicate the presence of infection in the colon, kidney, appendix, or bladder. The answer should be kidney. This could indicate a kidney infection. This is the end of the slideshow.